Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us today in our session, Leading a Successful Surgical Growth Strategy Using AI and Automation, Lessons from Alina Health. I'm Julia Connell, and I'm a director on our Member Insights team here at the Academy, and I'm going to be our moderator for today's session. Before we get started, though, I want to cover a couple of quick housekeeping notes. So first, all of your lines have been placed on mute, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. In fact, we encourage you to ask questions and share your experiences through the chat function. Uh, because we're a big group, you can find the chat function to share your questions and experiences in the bottom of your window. You can send them out to either the whole group or just to me directly, and I'll be sure to tee them up to our panelists for today. I also wanted to note we're going to be recording today's session, and I will be sure to share a link to the slides and recording in follow-up. So with that, let's get into it. So we're here today to talk about surgical growth. And we wanted to start by talking about where you and many of your peers shared you are today. So last month, we conducted a survey of leading health system executives from 21 health systems across the country. And here's what we found. The first thing is growth has been top of mind for health systems, many of which are facing challenging financial times, particularly as we enter the second half of 2022. And when we ask specifically about surgical services revenue at health systems, the vast majority or 76% of health systems noted that increasing their surgical services revenue was a top health system priority. And importantly, no respondents said it was not a priority. And it's a pressing problem too. Uh, over half of health systems plan to increase their investment in surgical assets across the next one to two years. Unsurprising as surgical services is a top revenue generator for many health systems. On the next slide, we, we also asked leaders to share their approaches to growing surgical revenue. And what we heard is that it's not just narrowly focused on operating room scheduling and access, but rather health system leaders are looking at surgical revenue in ways of driving end-to-end -end growth. For example, through growing their case volumes, reducing leakage, and optimizing their case mix, which you can see in the, the graph here. But I think most importantly, or one of the, the key things that jumped out to me was the final aspect that we looked at here, which is how health systems are executing on each of those strategies today. So uh, on the left and right, we included some data on what the results were for scheduling processes currently at health systems when it comes to their OR scheduling process and what they want that to look like or their ideal process. And what stands out to me is that when you look at the left, today, only about 10% of uh, OR processes are completely automated at health systems, whereas where most health system leaders indicated they want to be is having uh, is being 52% automated. So that's a significant gap that we see in, in the market. And when we think about surgical growth, there's a, it's clear there's an opportunity to improve efficiency and think strategically about the role that technology can play in these processes. So today, we're going to hear firsthand how Alina Health approached this exact problem. And I have two panelists here who are going to walk us through their story. So first, we have Bill Evans, who's the Vice President of Surgical Services and Orthopedics for Alina Health. In his role, Bill supports operating room performance, as well as the surgical and procedural and orthopedic clinical service lines across the system. He's led numerous projects for the system, including the creation of an ambulatory surgery center strategy, and is a graduate of St. Olaf College with double major degrees in psychology and economics. He also earned his MBA at the University of St. Thomas. Bill is also a past president of the Minnesota Medical Group Management Association. Uh, so we're, we're so excited to have Bill here with us today. 
and then also we have David Atashru from Cuventus. He's the managing director of Perioperative Solutions. And in this role, David serves as a strategic advisor to health system leaders and surgeons on the use of automation technology. He also works closely with Cuventus implementation and product teams to drive new innovations using Cuventus's real-time automation platform. He holds a doctorate in medicine from the University of Missouri-Columbia and trained in plastic surgery at the University of Kentucky before completing his postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University School of Medicine. So in addition to his role at Cuventus, Dr. Tashru continues his clinical practice at the University of California, San Francisco. So thank you so much, David, for being with us today. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much. We're excited to be here and to share our journey with you today. Uh, so I'll begin and we'll first just take a few moments to talk a little bit about uh, Alina Health and Abbott Northwestern for those who are not familiar. We'll spend a little bit of time just talking about our periop journey that got us to this point. And then David will talk to us about AI and automation as it pertains to strategic growth. And then we'll talk about the results that we've had together. We'll leave a little bit of time at the end, of course, for questions and answers. Next slide, please. There we go. Thank you. So for those who are not familiar, Alina Health is a uh, large not-for-profit healthcare system in the uh, greater Minneapolis area. You know, we're about a $5 billion organization. And uh, one of the things uh, to note is we were recently named uh, the one of the top five large health systems by Fortune magazine. So we really uh, view ourselves as kind of at the upper echelon of systems across the nation. Next slide. Just a quick map, uh, again, really serving the uh, Minneapolis and a little bit into the Wisconsin, really within that, that two hour area of the Twin Cities market is really our key spot. We obviously have a number of primary care and urgent care clinics in addition to specialties, and then our, our 12 different hospitals. Next slide. And so today we're gonna talk a little bit about Abbott Northwestern Hospital. This is our quaternary hospital um, with a total of 36 operating rooms. It is a mixture of employed and independent practices who are, are comprised the surgical base for Abbott Northwestern. A little bit uh, just to help set the context, Abbott tends to be a very forward thinking, very entrepreneurial uh, hospital. So as you can see, a number of different awards were always rate, uh, rated as one of the top uh, hospitals in the Minneapolis area. And in addition, our surgery center was just named one, number one in the state, top 10 in the nation. Uh, Newsweek named us one of the top 100 hospitals in the world. And then just most recently, we were uh, named, I think, 15th in the world in terms of smart hospitals. So really being at the forefront of technology is, is really uh, part of our culture. Next slide, please. So with that, we'll talk a little bit about our periop journey. I'm sure like many of the people on the, this call today, our, our team really was challenged several years ago in the time before COVID to really try to optimize our surgical service. is It is a core service to everything that we do. It's obviously a financial driver of the organization. And there was a sense that we had opportunity that we were not capturing. We were convinced that there were, were cases out in the market that we could capture if we could actually improve the consistency of our operating rooms. So as you see in 2018, 2019, we started a number of different uh, work streams to try to really maximize the utility of our operating rooms. We actually brought in some national consultants and with their work, we created uh, what we consider to be the, the uh, value stream process improvement, really looking at all of the waste and inefficiency that occurs in the entire value chain. So when we think about it, that is everything from when the clinic indicates surgery is appropriate all the way through the day of surgery, the surgery itself, and then into the actual discharge to pack you. So we really spent a lot of time trying to eliminate all the waste and the variability in those processes through creating some standard work for all different roles. We uh, also created a system-wide surgery scheduling policy. Again, trying to use policy to manage our block and really fill our, our OR time as efficiently as we could. And then finally, we created a strong governance structure. So we created at each site a periop executive committee, which is comprised of our OR directors, medical directors, hospital leadership, anesthesia partners, key surgical leaders. 
And then we also created a surgeon advisory group, trying to make sure that our surgeons had a forum to really tell us what's working and what's not working. And so through the next two years, 2018, 2019, moving into 2020, we really tried to leverage all of those things to their fullest ability to maximize the utility of our operating rooms. Obviously COVID came along and like many of the sites, I'm sure we ended up uh, increasing and decreasing our surgical volumes as COVID allowed. And so as we've now moved into 2022, what we became really clear to us is that we needed something different. I could see in our surgical schedules that we still were not actually filled as much as we could be. And so that's where after having done all of the other work that we could, we recognize that there probably was a need for something different. And that led us then to thinking about automation a little bit differently. Next slide, please. And so with that, you know, as we looked at everything else that we had done, it, it was clear that what had not changed was our surgery scheduling process. We still, we are of course using our, our block policy to try to manage our volumes to the best of our ability, but it clearly wasn't working. And so as we looked at it, our manual processes really had not changed in 30 years. We still had our surgery scheduling department using email, fax machines, uh, and just really was not sufficient. We had surgeons that were very, very frustrated because they couldn't get the access that we wanted. Our surgical scheduling team was not very satisfied with their jobs. And we just knew that there was gaps and waste in our OR time. So as we looked at all the different solutions, we recognized that automation really probably had to be that next step in our journey because we recognized that there was definitely waste and inefficiency that we could not get in uh, knowing our other processes. So that started us down the path towards automation. Next slide, please. And so as we started thinking about automation and what that might look like, um, I took what I consider to be a fairly um, methodical approach to getting approval and moving this through our organization. So the way I personally went about this, and hopefully this is helpful for others on the call, it, it first was clear to me that I needed to make sure that our OR leadership team was on board. So I started with our OR director and our scheduling manager. And as we started talking about the need for automation, they very quickly could recognize that there was a need for something different. And so once I had them lined up, my next stop then was to go to our hospital president. He was gonna be my funding source. So I needed to make sure that I actually had the funds available to proceed. Once I had those lined up and I knew that I had the, the buy-in from all of the key stakeholders from that perspective, then we really started working through our periop executive team, our surgeon advisory group, trying to get buy-in from all of the key stakeholders who actually would be using the, the product itself. Once we had that landed and, and very quickly, everyone recognized that there was definitely a need for something different. We then started just moving through the formal approval process in our organization. That means going to our IT department, making sure that we have the resources, all of our support departments. But by that point, once I'd already gotten the groundswell from all of the frontline users, it was not a question of if we were going to do it, it was going to be a question of when and how. So it really made our journey fairly easy. As you can see, it took us about six months. I think it was probably even less than, than that. And honestly, it was a fairly seamless process because everyone could see a very compelling business case. That then led us to David and the QVentus team. David. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> I appreciate it. And um, I think it was a pleasure to actually work with you on that process and, and going from initial vision to contracting and, and, and getting started with your team. And so we've been really grateful and excited about the partnership we have with Alina. Um, for the sake of our time that we have together, what I'd like to do is just introduce you to Cubanus and the theory behind how we approach solving the problems within the operating room. We don't have time to do a full demo, but what I'll do is hit the highlights of our perspective on when you look at operations management in the AOR, how should you think about doing that? And then if you're interested, we're happy to come back and do a demo for you all individually on the product. So first, some background on Cubanus. So, Cubetis is a Silicon Valley-based healthcare technology company founded 12 years ago. The DNA is Stanford PhDs in applied math and machine learning, ex-McKinsey healthcare consultants, and then clinicians also, like myself, who still practice. Our mission is to simplify how healthcare operates. And we do that by automating care operations. In this instance, for today's conversation, focusing on surgery operations, and that's looking at it from diagnosis through discharge. And we achieve this by combining modern innovations in artificial intelligence, machine learning, behavioral science, and then a deep expertise across clinical operations, performance improvement, and then change management. 
So the other part of this is to enable health systems to transform their care operations, we provide a complete system, which includes a, a real-time automation platform, and then best practice solutions built on top of that, and then expert services to implement our technology. It's people, process, and technology here that's brought to bear. And I think we're really grateful that we've had the opportunity to work over many years with lots of hospitals and many situations, from academics to community systems, to safety net hospitals, and also be in a position that we've had hundreds of deployments across multiple EMRs, ranging from Meditech to Allscripts to Cerner to Epic. So as we've talked about some of these challenges at Alina and that Bill kind of went through, I wanted to share a perspective about how we thought about Acuvenus solving those challenges. And namely, that's in taking the same AI that you find in your everyday life applied through automation. And those are the types of things that we've come to rely on in our personal lives, but we haven't seen them applied to actually make things easier in our professional lives. So consider this. At home, you're able to quickly look up all options for travel within seconds online. Not the case in the OR. At home, in your personal lives, machine learning suggests with really high accuracy what movies you might be interested in watching, and then it learns your taste and evolves over time. Again, not something that we have in our professional lives. AI helps airlines manage yield optimization so that flights stay as profitable as possible. And finally, you've got all this automation at home that takes over many of your routine tasks that just a few years ago, like turning on their lights and adjusting the temperature that would have been difficult. The question you have to ask is why don't we have access to the same type of technology in the perioperative space? It's not that it doesn't exist. It's not that we, it's just that we haven't capitalized on that opportunity with innovators and leaders like Bill at these health systems like Alina. And so the opportunity we're going after is really pretty singular. It's automating surgical operations. We start with strategic growth, and in the process of doing this through automation, we also simplify the operations itself. And the question is, if that's the goal, how do you get there in the fastest and in the most sustainable way? And there are really four key things that are required. And I consider these the A, B, and Cs. These are the things that you should look for. And these are the four things that Cubetus does uniquely well. And the first is artificial intelligence. So this is models actually built on your data. They're local and improving over time. That means they're learning, right? And they're operationalized into intuitive interfaces for end users, just like what you would see in ways for navigation, a prediction operationalized to an end decision that actually can affect an action, turning left, turning right. And without that, though, you've got a rules-based system, block releases at a specific time, a digital calendar for the schedule, but that's it. But with AI, what you get is a personalized outreach to fill white spaces strategically, a faster interface to find the times you're looking for. And just what, like you see in Google search with prioritized results. So you can actually find the things that are important to you first. So the second thing that you need is automation. And that's to do things automatically that you would otherwise have to do manually. It includes things like bidirectional integration into your EMR. So you can both read and write back. And the thing, the problem is without that, you have schedules mainly transcribing surgeon booking sheets and scouring the schedule to figure out how to make, for instance, time on the robot. But if you've got it, then with it, what you can do is have the ability to automate the ability to create capacity and then obviate some tasks that schedulers would otherwise have to do manually. The third key component is behavioral science. It provides the why. If we're asking someone to do something, we should provide the why in the context of what's in it for them and make it easy for them to take the action. Without it, what you get is frustration. People aren't really happy. It's not personalized and you don't get much engagement. But with it, what you get is more releases, more engagement, more people understanding why are you asking them to do the things you are. And the last thing that you need is comprehensive data. That's data outside of the EMR. The most comprehensive market data is what you want to be able to access in real time and then connect it to the automation platform. Without it, what you have is growth that's constrained. You can really only see and tap into what you already have. But with it, you can look at volume beyond what you already have and excite surgeons and allow them to do things like figure out how do they shape their practices to develop the center of excellence that they want to. So those ABCs are built in the fabric of everything we do. And those are the things that enable the solution to work. So those four capabilities come together to enable the performance of the four modules of our platform. And we'll give you our high level perspective and then expand on each. The first thing you need to do 
is open up as much of the schedule as possible, as far out as possible by, by creating capacity and access. And we do this when, with a number of machine learning predictions with the output of that automated into a number of thoughtful nudges. So then the second thing you have to do is fill the available time maximally and strategically by proactively bringing the time to the surgeons who are actually the best fit for it, which we do at Cuvenus with the available time outreach model, and then creating a marketplace where you can find time in 10 seconds and book it in two minutes. And we do that with TimeFinder. And there's a number of machine learning models underneath that that allow you to do things like find the time faster in the interface and accurately predict case length. So those are the first two. The third thing you must do is to deliver to your leaders at every altitude, the situational awareness they need to focus on what is most important and actionable in the moment. And then the predictive analytics to help them plan. We do that here with optimized performance. But beyond that, because of our system architecture, we can also build nudges on top of it to fix your most important problems before they occur. Things like delayed starts and case misestimations. So you're not always looking in the rear view mirror, you're proactively fixing the problems without requiring a human being to look at a dashboard and take some additional step. And then the fourth thing is giving yourself a competitive advantage in the market and improving patient outcomes by enabling your surgeons to grow the cases that they care most about and do better than anyone else at a high volume center. And we do this with market insights built on the most comprehensive near real time market claims data set available. So if those are the four components, let me click into each one here to unpack this a little bit. So the first step you need to take is to unlock as much time on the schedule as possible, as far out as possible without frustrating your surgeons. Machine learning is really good for that. And this is the first place that the AI and the automation and the behavioral science kind of come together as a complete package. We've seen existing software take a rules-based approach around when to send release reminders. But here's the problem with that. The first thing is you lose time. Time that you need and otherwise could get, you may not have access to because you're using a rules-based approach about when to reach out. The second thing is frustrated engagement. As a surgeon, I can tell you, it is to know and frustrating when someone reaches out to me in an unintelligent way. And the first thing you lose is you lose my trust and then you lose my engagement. And so you need to be smart about when you reach out that it makes sense. And again, provide that reason why. And the third thing is without a machine learning approach, it's static. I know that every operating room that I've worked in is never the same quarter to quarter. There are new surgeons, there's people leaving, there are changing dynamics and how people book and things that come up and seasonal practice pattern variations. A rules-based approach can't accommodate for those things, but machine learning can. And let's look at a few scenarios here. Here's kind of what you're seeing here as it plays out. And scenario one, with a rules-based approach, you're reminding too late because someone's typical lead time is actually 23 days, but maybe you're only pinging on a rules-based reminder at 14 days, or you're reminding them too early. What's the problem with that? A surgeon is really frustrated because they just booked their cases with less lead time and they don't want to be bothered about a, a release when they actually would have used the time. The third and fourth scenarios have to do with evolving practice patterns and the ability to be able to have a model update that. And so with me, machine learning, you've got greater flexibility to protect those unused blocks as early out as possible. Then the model can learn booking patterns by block owner to nudge them at the right times. And it can adapt as patterns change, such as if a surgeon extends their lead time to a change in a case mix, for instance. And then the ML is scalable across service lines and surgeons. So it'll grow with your operations. The impact is that ML creates more delight. Really, it's through personalization and it feels more intelligent and that creates more impact. And that end result of that is it increases lead time for releases. And what we found enabled up to release upwards of hundreds of hours of block per month. And so let me show you an, an example of what that looks like as it plays out. So how this comes to life in Cuvenus is through a series of nudges. Now these can be enabled through email, they can be enabled in other ways, but you're getting a sense here of how we do this. It's not just about pinging someone automatically at the first moment. It's about being able to ping them on just the right amount of time at the right moment, in this case, 21 days out from surgery. It's about giving them the context to be able to help them understand why you were making this request. And it's about giving them what's in it for them. What 
is the thing that they may gain from making this decision in this moment. It's also about figuring out how do you make this super easy for them to take this action so that in one click, they can, they can do that. And also accommodating for the fact that there are different varieties and setups of block, which that create different dynamics. So for instance, if I'm in a service line, I'm very reticent to release my time before checking with the rest of my team. If you can automate that workflow though, you remove barriers that often prevent this happening ahead of time. All right, so next thing. Now that you have the time, the second thing you need to do is fill the time. And let's start with what normally happens here. With everyone else, it's an open white space on the schedule and it gets filled in a first come first serve way. But what's unique about Kubernetes' approach is that AI and automation can be used to attract strategic cases. So typical scheduling software today, the 1.0 solution, right? Relies on the surgeon or the scheduler to manually find time by searching on a calendar. Well, the OI scheduler has to reach out to the potential surgeons that they have a relationship with who might have the cases. There's a few problems with that. One, it's passive. Surgeons need to log in, run a search, find a time that works for them, see if it's available. A lot more work involved. The second thing is it's manual. How many calls does the OR scheduler need to make to fill that time? The third thing is it's not strategic. Maybe the scheduler fills a time with a, a low margin case when they could have filled it with something with higher value, or just maybe there's a situation in which you're trying to work through a backlog that's strategically important, let's say with oncology cases where your lead time extended beyond what you needed it to be, and there's more important cases to get into that slot. And the fourth thing is there's no accountable way for how my scheduler does or does not do in using that white space that I could have used. As a surgeon, that's important to me. I want to make sure that they're actively utilizing all the opportunities that are available for them to help me get into the operating room. But I don't have any way to know how they're doing that outside of a system like this. But with QVenis, we're automating this process. Our ML is tailored to your strategic goals, takes that into account, and it's tons of factors. Like, does the surgeon practice this day? Is there a time gap sufficient for the surgeon in his type of cases? Is this a location the surgeon practice at? And then when it, what it does is it prioritizes every single surgeon against that time, anytime there's a late release or a cancellation or an open space, and it finds the best fit surgeon based on booking patterns and previous engagement. And so we're actively reaching out to surgeons in an automated prioritized manner in line with your strategic goals. This removes their burden from the OR schedulers to manually fill the time. What we find with this is why we're able to drive two plus cases per OR per month in volume. Why are we able to increase the utilization of release time to over 50%? And what that looks like is something like this. It comes to life in these outreaches that go to schedulers about time that's available on the schedule. Like if there's a new robotic time block, block available, we wanna reach out directly to the surgeons that can actually use that block. We wanna let them know that this time is available and would they like to book a case in that slot? We also wanna use some behavioral science to, to drive some scarcity and urgency that the time may get used, but we'll give them a little bit of time before we let anyone else know. And then we wanna actually have a true machine learning model that learns based off of how they respond and it evolves with their practice patterns. Again, so we can be more personalized in the outreach to them. Okay, so if that is the, the push piece, you also need a self-service way for surgeons to access your schedule and do that in a way that removes any friction to get on the schedule and book into a white space. We do that here with Cubanus by creating a digital marketplace. But before we dive in, let me share a perspective here. Now, traditionally, if I need to find a different time, I'd call the OR. I have to be on hold and go through the process of finding a time one by one. Maybe I even get frustrated and just drop the call and go somewhere else or delay it to the next available block. Next came in this world, scheduling software 1.0. Essentially that is a, a digital calendar. And for sure there's a benefit to that, but it's still manual and generic. It's requiring you to click through and search and find a good time day by day, look across the calendar. But at QVenice, we created next generation scheduling. So think about it, it's just like Google. We learn your patterns so we can personalize the output of your search to you. Things like when you have clinic, when you like to practice, how long your cases typically take. So we show you all of the options across the desired times in a single glance, down to the hours that are available, not just a broad block. And we also show you the most appropriate times right at the top and all the options in a prioritized order. Why? Because it's delightful, because that's what you've come accustomed to in your personal lives. And so now you can find time in 10 seconds. You can book it in two minutes. And this is the part as a surgeon I would say it's really exciting is that I can give my patients a confirmed time for their operation 
before they make it home from my office that day. That is a complete experience that I can offer them. We've also found from this a 33% reduction in inbound calls, the OR scheduling teams, a 50% reduction in calls dropped from hold, and all this in the face of a reduced FTE in scheduling, which is helpful for the teams that are managing through the complexity of these staffing challenges. So let me give you a blink at what that looks like. Again, we don't have time to go into this in depth, but I'll show you what this interface looks like. So my scheduler can in one, one go in 10 seconds, pull up me, say she's looking to book a case, look at the times that are available from now out, knowing that I wanna get this case in sooner, but my block may be full and I miss this. Let me do that again. We'll start here and go out. There we go. And then I'm able to select my case directly pulling from the EMR. We can auto populate an actual predicted case length. They can, my scheduler can see the available block time, but what's great is they can actually start to see and change their standard work on how they book time to see what's actually available at open time. And as opposed to how they used to do things, they can now turn that computer around to the patient and say, hey, here are the times that my surgeon's available. I can, I can show you block time, but I can show you time that you can get into the operating room even sooner in my surgeon's uh, white space that he, he can book into. And instead of having to hunt and peck, they can see the top times that could fit that surgeon at the very top, select a couple times, indicate the true preference of that time for that surgeon, indicate actually the true availability of that surgeon. Let's say they've got clinic and aren't available in the morning, include a procedural order form electronically if that's needed, click submit and have that submitted to the operating room in one go. All of that in a few seconds and without ever anyone having to pick up the phone. So moving on to the next case. So the, last, the, the, the third thing that I wanna talk about was that component around analyzing performance. Data analytics is actually where Kubernetes started. So for us, we view this as kind of the bread and butter. At every altitude, we have analytics to help your leaders, whether that's an executive, an OR scheduler, or a surgeon. But notice what's different here. We're not making you slice and dice, which you can do if you want. We'll give you that capability. But serving up insights to you that automate the work you would have to do manually or just wait to receive. We also go beyond that, what you're seeing there on the right, to use automation to serve directors actionable decisions when we've actually found a solution and an opportunity to fix a problem before it occurs. In this case, like proactively creating space on the robot. These are the types of things that are different about our platform and our system architecture. It's not about just showing you data. I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone that has world and time enough to sit and look at data all day. It's wonderful, it's important. It provides you awareness and that it allows you to plan. That In that way, it's good. But for the day-to-day -day operations, I want analytics tied to AI that is then orchestrating action behind the scenes to fix problems before they occur. So I'm not just looking at things in the rearview mirror, I'm getting to enjoy the results of it getting fixed ahead of time. And that's what we're doing here with Cubanus. And so this is why we can do things like see a 33% increase in robotics cases or see a 13% decrease in non-robotics cases booked in robotic rooms. And I'll give you a blink at what that looks like here as well. So if I switch over here to the insights page, uh, and as that loads for a second, what I wanna to talk to you about here is, again, you're getting a chance to see at every altitude, the different analytics that exists for every surgeon and every scheduler and every OR leader. And so as you look into the insights page here, you see a set of insights to get delivered for executives, a set for block, a set for surgeons, a set for the market. You could also dive in and see more here. You could also create your own bespoke insights and your own dashboards. Um, if I was to click in here to the surgeon practice view, you can get a look here of what the insights look like for them. Block utilization and their case booking opportunities, their case volumes, their accuracy and efficiency. Don't have time to dive into this, but again, what we're trying to do is deliver these things to people's fingertips. So there's no more having the wrong definitions, no more having to pull these reports out of the EMR and transform them in Excel. We wanna allow you to have them so you can just work off them directly and increase transparency directly to all the people that you work with on your team and I think this is critical. Also show them the opportunity to win more by using the platform, reinforcing its use, but also show them the missed opportunity and where this opportunity is for maybe some conversations about doing better. All right, fourth and last thing here. Next, you'll reach a point 
in your journey where you've tapped out your existing referral base, you've grown as much as you can grow at, in your current space. And to grow market share, you need to move upstream of the patient journey. Where are patients actually being referred to a competitor? Are there new referral streams you can tap into? And that's where you can really unlock meaningful growth, which is where our market insight module comes in. We leverage a best in claim, class claims database with 300 million covered lives that is updated month, monthly that enables you to look outside the four walls of your hospital and then navigate in the market in ways your competitors can't. And that your surgeons have been desperate to for and wanted to see. No surgeon wants to do 100 hemorrhoidectomies to do five sigmoid colectomies. But how do you get them? And if you need 100 this year to develop a center of excellence, how do you bridge the gap of the 50 more that you need? Well, Cubanus provides you the tools to be able to do that and be able to reinforce the referral relationships. I'll come back here one second. So I'll give you a chance to take a look at what that looks like. So every surgeon can see at their fingertips where they stand in the market for their top procedures. They can see the health of their top referrers and where there may be an opportunity needed to re-engage. They can see for the procedures that they care most about, how they're trending over time in the market, but they can also see really interesting and, and, and meaningful things like where they might have an opportunity to consolidate referrals from a provider that already refers to them, but they didn't realize only refers a fraction or a portion of their volume. Or where are the refer referring providers in the community that are fragmented, demonstrating they're taking a shotgun approach route. They haven't developed a relationship with anyone in the market, but they could with a surgeon that showed that they had ability, that showed they had affability, and that showed that they had access. All three things that we can give them and then also just having the surgeon to get a chance to understand where they're trending in the market and where the new referring providers exist in the market. So these are the types of things that are possible with Cubanus. And with that, I think to time, I'll transition back to you, uh, Bill. Excellent. Thank you for that great overview. So we're going to take just a few minutes and just talk about how our results have been coming. We're still early in this. So as you'll see in our, our next few slides, uh, you know, we really started doing this work back in June. So I'm thrilled with what we're seeing in the data so far. Um, as you'll see in this slide, we've started with a phased approach. Going back to some of the initial conversations, it was in particular our robot surgeons, our Da Vinci uh, and intuitive surgical uh, teams that really were uh, complaining about the access issues that we had. So we started with them as our physician champions, our core group. And so we, we started with that being our first phase. Our second phase, we then rolled out to all block holders. And then our third and final phase was basically everybody else, anybody who still had privileges and did cases, but it wasn't necessarily a block holder. So as you can see, almost immediately, we started seeing that white space uh, being created as, as David spoke to. That is really uh, getting people to start releasing their block time earlier than what our policy was but was mandating earlier than we would have gotten. So we were creating a ton of additional OR time, as you can see, 82 hours in the first three months. So really exciting to be able to create that additional capacity. Next slide. How has it actually gone in terms of the uptake? It's been incredibly successful. I think one of the things that we have found is you see 130 surgeons that are using the product. That pretty much is all of our key surgeons. That basically is almost everybody that actually has privileges and is doing cases at our hospital. So it's one where it quickly uh, sprung up. And as you can see in our phased approach, it really took to life very quickly. As soon as we went live with any phase, almost immediately, we started seeing a really significant uptick in all of our surgeons. And then at this point in time, the vast majority of our cases are actually being booked through the solution. We have not mandated, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, this is a strictly volunteer type uh, position. This is a tool to help our surgeons. It is not something that we required. So I think seeing 76% of the cases coming through the solution so quickly has really been very exciting for us. Move to the next slide. How have we done in terms of the actual robotic procedures? That was the initial thesis, is trying to make sure that we were able to create capacity to get more robot cases done. As you can see in the graphs, really significant uptake. So the vast majority of our robot cases now are actually being scheduled on the solution. And as you can see, we are way ahead of how we had actually been doing our robot cases uh, compared to last year. It's worth noting that in September of 2021, we started actually having some COVID delays. I don't think that affected our robot data, 
But as you can see, even in the initial phases in um, July, August, and now September, really significant uptake in our robotic cases and really excited to see that, that time getting filled. We'll go on to the next slide. And then in terms of just case growth, are we actually then bringing in new cases? So as we create the white space, are we then filling uh, the operating room uh, time that we're creating? What we've seen obviously, as you can see here, is a very significant increase in the number of cases that are being added. I would also add that uh, I'm sure like many of the people on this call, our operating rooms probably are not the biggest rate limiting factor to surgical volumes right now. It's actually our hospital flow. Uh, we've got a number of potential bottlenecks that are occurring in our hospitals. And so I'm not really able at this point in time to run our ORs full throttle like I would normally be able to in a pre-COVID era. And so as we see the number of cases being added here through the platform, I think that will be significantly increased when we get all of the hospital throughput resolved. I, I expect to be two to three times that number in very short order once we get to those bottlenecks. Go on to the next slide, please. And then how is the team actually responding to it? This is one of the pleasant surprises to me, I have to admit. Um, as we were starting to have conversations with our surgeons about bringing the solution in, uh, one of our surgeons actually asked, you know, to what degree am I actually building the financial modeling off of decreasing the number of surgery scheduling staff? That hadn't even crossed my mind. This is a tool to help use our ORs more efficiently. Um, so I had absolutely no expectation of actually reducing staff but what I have found is that it actually has been a huge staff engagement. Our teams, our OR schedulers, we had significant turnover that was going on prior to this solution. Now people are really engaged. They love actually having a cool cutting edge tool that makes their jobs easier. Our surgeons are thrilled with it. And so as you're seeing, one of the reasons why I think we've been so successful is that you know, 96% of the requests being able to be fulfilled, it's been very successful in terms of actually when somebody submits a request, being able to actually solve their problem. We've been quick on the response. So as, as David mentioned, 24 minutes from when that submission goes in to when we acknowledge it and have it on the OR schedule. We can have a surgeon drop five or six cases in on us and have them almost instantly approved. So that's really been powerful. And as you can see, 84% responded within an hour. So I think that really has been the case study of, of why it's been so successful for us is because all of the different pieces are working together to actually solve the problems that each of the individual stakeholders had. So really uh, one of the pleasant surprises to me is how much our actual surgery scheduling team has really embraced that. So with that, our final piece is just the lessons learned. What have we learned through all this from an Alina perspective? First and foremost, you can't underestimate how important it is to get the employment uh, or the engagement of your surgeons and your staff they are your key stakeholders. Making sure that this really does solve their problems is going to be vital. Meeting with the clinic teams, the other end user is going to be in the clinics. And so we personally had our surgery scheduler teams connect with the clinic teams. The Cuventus teams actually came out on site and went into the clinics too. So really making sure there was strong support all the way around for the clinics who are being asked to change how they uh, have their processes. For us, the phasing was useful. Uh, I think being able to really start with some key physician champions and then making sure that we then build it out into the black holders from there was really very powerful. This sounds pretty basic, but listening to the experts, you know, this is one where you know Cuventus brings a significant expertise, but our OR scheduling team, our, our surgery scheduling manager has 30 years of experience. She has institutional knowledge that is uh, vital Likewise, the surgeons, the end users. So making sure that all of your key stakeholders really have a chance to weigh in and have a, a chance to, to really put their fingerprints on it, I think was really helpful. For us, as I mentioned, we did not mandate this. And I think that has been one of the uh, reasons why it's been so successful. This is a surgeon engagement tool. We have found our surgeons really embrace this because it solves their problems. It is something that if we had mandated and it came across as you know, you are going to use this product whether you want to or not, we would have encountered a ton of resistance in our staff. That may just be our culture, but certainly if you're going to try to mandate it, I would, I would proceed cautiously personally. The amount of pre-work I think is important. So, you know, as I mentioned, we did a lot of work on our own process improvement. Our surgery scheduling policy was really, I think, hardwired in our organization. So having the fundamentals was really important. 
And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, I don't think it is an over-exaggeration that, that we are going to be able to see a 10% increase in our uh, OR volumes and the OR utilization. Even if we can only uh, increase that uh, by 5%, I'm going to be thrilled. But I think from what we're seeing in this initial data, I think it is reasonable to expect that we're going to see a 10% increase in the util utilization of our operating rooms. So with that, thank you. And I think we have some time for Q&A here. Yeah, we definitely do. And thank you so much, Bill and David. You know, th this is really an incredible story and uh, reflecting on, you know, that last piece you shared there about some of the lessons learned. I, I think what a lot of health systems are thinking about right now are, you know, how can we make incremental progress right now? And so the the piece you mentioned, the last piece about 10% or even 5%, you know, that that's a huge deal. So uh, really excited to have had you share some of this story today. Um, we're starting to have a few questions come in, but if you haven't thought about your questions yet, this is your official notice to start putting them in the chat. In the meantime, you know, uh, we talked a lot about where you're at so far in the process, Bill, but I'd love to know, you know, what are you excited about next or what is the, what does the future look like at Alina? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, thrilled by what we've seen in the uh, initial data. I'm most excited about rolling this out to our tertiary hospitals. Abbott Northwestern is our partner where we do the most complex cases. But I think when we go into our tertiary hospitals, we're going to see very similar results. The need cases are a little bit different there, but I'm really excited by that. And then frankly, you know, I'm, I'm excited to continue to see what new um, evolution comes with this, this software. Obviously with machine learning, it's constantly learning. And so I expect that we're gonna see continued improvement through there as well. That's great. Um, thank you. And we had a couple of kind of technical questions come in. So David, I, I'm hoping you could take a couple of those. I saw you answered them, but want to make sure the rest of the group can hear them too. Uh, so one of the first ones is where does market insight come from? I'll let you tackle that one and then we'll yeah, go to the next one. I, I dropped that one in, in the chat, but uh, what we did was we negotiated uh, exclusive access with one of the best in class uh, claims database companies. Uh, so they pull from seven of the nine top clearing houses. Um, no data is perfect, but it's the best that exists. No, and I think what we were able to do with that was then combine that with um, our data from the EMR and your usage data. And then I think importantly, enable a system where we can get that data in a near real-time basis. So we're working off of claims as, as soon as eight days ago that are dropped. Great, thank you. And it looks like uh, Sandeep, your hand is raised. So willing to experiment with coming off mute as long as you go back on mute once you're finished your question. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is a pleasure to join. And uh, it, it, it was a great learning experience for me. Uh, my name is Sandeep Anant. I'm a surgical oncologist at uh, Northwell Health in New York. And uh, Dr. Atashru, I think, Thank you for that fantastic talk and, Dr. Dr. and even the, uh, the talk from Dr. Evans as well. Uh, one of the questions I had was, do we have any technology available at this point for the surgical tray optimization for the instruments to be processed and uh, a tool that you digitally can locate the, 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 the surgical instruments and the consumables in the operating room? Yeah, it's it's a really good question, Sandy. Um, we have not developed a solution yet on asset management and digital tracking of, of the assets. So it's not a direction we have gone in. I will say one of the things that we believe in QNS and one of our secret kind of strengths is, is being able to um, develop new solutions quickly. We have a, a really, I think, unique perspective on how we do product development. Um, and we look across our base and look at our partners and understand what are the most common problems that they have. And then we set it against a roadmap and we're open to doing that because of the system architecture we have, pulling in other data from different APIs is something we're really good at. So we did that with the claims data, 700 billion rows of data we can get in a monthly poll. So that's something we are good at and in the orchestration we're good at, but to be very clear, we haven't, we haven't done it in asset management. Thank you for your response. Thank you. And then I've got a question from Vaughn on chat. And then David, I see your hand raised and we'll go to you uh, next. So 
first from Vaughn. Uh, this is a question for Bill. For the 20% of surgeons that are not using Cubentis to book cases, what is the reasoning to not use the platform? And did you set an expectation to use Cubentis or was it communicated as optional? Yeah, for us, it was very deliberately and set up as optional. Um, we have a number of uh, independent surgeons who have the ability to take volume to multiple systems. And so we wanted to, to be a physician friendly uh, poll strategy. So with that, um, we, we felt it would not fit our culture to mandate use. We could at some point perhaps get to that point, but certainly in the early phases, we felt like this was going to be better presented as a tool to help them actually manage their block time and find uh, case time when they needed it. So with that, um, you know, not every single case is being scheduled. Um, and, and I think that is very appropriate. I think we're perfectly fine with that. Um, at some point in time, we might uh, get to a different answer. But right now, um, we will continue to work with surgeons. So if there are any who are having challenges using the system uh, and finding that it's just not working as they had intended, we work very closely and directly with them. Yeah, and I think the other comment I'd have to that is it puts the onus on us. We don't want to have to force people to use something. We want them to just to be delighted to do it. And so exactly. a lot of our roadmap focuses on how do we drive clinic scheduler delight? So they want to use the product so that it's the easy button for them. It's enjoyable. Um, if you create that onus, then I think a lot of good things fall up from that. Great. Thank you both for your thoughtful answers there. Uh, David, now over to you if you want to come off mute. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for taking my questions. I got a few thoughts and questions. Um, Dr. Anantha mentioned integrating with um, sterile processing or something. For example, we use SPM to track all our sterile processing. One would hope that there could be some level of integration. For example, if my hand surgeon tries to book six carpal tunnels in a row, the system will figure out that we can't produce six carpal tunnel trays back to back and yes. somehow learn that you can't do that. So that is something I would love to chat with you about. That definitely seems possible. Um, there's a component of, there's, you know, there's a, a spectrum of how you approach this. Some of this can be just uh, writing rules in the right ways. Some of this is goes all the way to machine learning. Um, and there's different applications where rules are better. There's different applications where ML is better. But I think something like that, creating some constraints is totally something I'd be happy to chat with you about how we do that. Uh, next, next concern. So uh, we have multiple private surgeons that all use different EMRs in the office. When you showed that slide of how you're scheduling a case from the office, is the hospital-based scheduling program able to just sort of, uh, I don't know, upload or take the data from their EMR as to all the patient demographics and info, or are, are they going to have to type everything in to a form. In other words, can they say, okay, I've got Mr. Smith here in the office, all their demo demographics are in their system. Is there, does that just get ported into the system or are they just sitting there in essence, typing out an entire booking form on the uh, on their screen? Got it, yeah, I hear what you're saying. So given the, like, the complexity of multiple different EMRs, Right now, the way the schedulers do it, if they're in a, if they have a different EMR bespoke to their small system, let's say, they would be entering the information of the patient directly. Now, can we do it for other EMRs? Absolutely, we, we we're really good at integrating with EMRs, but we'd want it to be a subsistent, like substantial size and scale. Right, there are thousands of EMRs. Um, okay. So yeah. Just a. No, so, for example, we had three EMRs comprising eighty-five percent of our volume. We'd say let's go after those three and then the others would stay correct that's the way i would approach it correct yeah um you talked about the machine learning and uh lead time to booking what about surgeons that have a fair number of emergency cases those cases don't show up yeah. at any point on the elective schedule but those surgeons work a little better if their block time's not totally full because you know whatever 60 percent of the time they end up with an emergency case to the gap yeah. with. So, so that's actually a really good point. So a couple of points on that. The machine learning accommodates for that automatically. We recognize when people book more of their cases in, elect, in an emergent surgical manner and the model's predicting that, okay, well, maybe these people will actually fill that extra block with emergent time. So it, it does accommodate for that. The second thing is I think 
Um, as it re re relates to add-on case volume, I think one of the things that we've seen that's been exciting as we start to look at clients is a large reduction, upwards of 25% reduction in add-on surgical volume because we're creating space more electively on the schedule. And so things that couldn't, that didn't need to be done as an add-on are now being done electively, providing more predictability to you, but also for the surgeons that do add-on that need actual add-on time or emerging elective time, creating more space for them to do that. So that's another thing that I think that's helpful about how the platform accommodates. Uh, two more thoughts. Great. Actually, One. David, you know, oh, um, sorry, I sorry. love the enthusiasm and engagement here. There's two other questions I want to make sure that we get to, but okay. our panelists were generous enough. Both of them offered to share their emails and follow up. So happy to get you their contact information. Thank you so much for uh, the engagement, but the um, two kind of additional questions that uh, we got and that come up a lot of times when we're talking to health system leaders are, you know, first, Bill, I'd love your opinion on what led you to your decision to engage with an external partner versus building in-house. I think a lot of times when we talk about automation and AI, health systems are developing their own internal teams too. And so I'd love to, to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I appreciate the question. You know, I think we as an organization have come to the realization that we do a lot of things very well. Um, I think we were the first large system on Epic, I think uh, back in 2004. So you know, we've got a small village of people that actually help manage Epic and they do a nice job with that. But with that said, you know, I think we also recognize that uh, when you have somebody and something that is actually built specifically for a purpose, such as this tool, it's going to be better than anything that we can do on our own. And so I think as an organization, we really have embraced partnership for those areas where we recognize that we don't have that as a core competency. So in this particular case, we recognize very quickly that even though we've got, a, again, a, a really phenomenal team that helps manage our EMR, we would never be able to come up with something that was going to be nearly this effective on our own. Great, thank you for that. And then the, the last question uh, that I wanted to be sure we got to is, you know, especially right now when we think about technology, a lot of health systems are taking uh, the stance of thinking about Epic and their large EHR vendors first, especially when it comes to technology investments, right? And so when it came to the decision here, you know, how did you think about making the decision about waiting to see if Epic would uh, roll out a similar functionality versus uh, going with an outside, uh, a non-Epic solution? Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, for us uh, in this case, you know, Epic is great, right? It does a lot of things very well. Um, I think there's uh, always this question of when are you going to get a new tool? Is it going to meet your needs? In this particular case, I felt very comfortable that what we were seeing was going to be vastly superior to anything that Epic was going to bolt on in terms of this solution. And in addition, I'm also looking for a competitive advantage. If I'm using the same solution that everybody else is, what advantage do I get? So I was looking for something that was better and, and more distinctive personal. Yeah, and I, I I totally echo that with Bill. I think I've used a lot of EMRs. I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. Epic's my favorite, um, but they do different things. They were tasked with different things. Epic's really good at data capture, analytics. And so it's not really like an apples to apples comparison. I think the things that uh, Cubenis Designs is meant to complement Epic's capabilities now and in, in the future. So filling in the gaps of things that they may not be able to do as well that we can do a lot better um, and to be able to get that out early. You know, this isn't roadmap for us. This is live now, ready to go. And I think the opportunity cost of waiting is the, and the lost potential revenue and patient factors encountered from that is the reason why we've seen interest in, in moving forward. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both for your perspective there. I think uh, we're, we've are we got about one minute left. So if you have any additional questions, uh, we've had such great engagement today. Please feel free to send them in follow-up. You're more than welcome to email me. We're also going to send out the, the slides and the recording of the webinar today in follow-up, which will have some additional contact information if you'd like to get in touch with David or, or Bill. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. I don't know, David or, or Bill, if you have any closing thoughts that that you want to, anyone to take away from today's presentation. David, I'll leave it with you. Yeah, no, uh, I think just um, 
as I look back on the journey we've gone on together, um, you can't really create transformation in this space unless you come together with the right partners. Um, I knew as a clinician, I was one part of the puzzle. I knew technology was the other, but reaching across the aisle and working with hospital administrators like Bill, I think Bill, I think we've just been really grateful. Um, being able to do something together that it's it's creating a win-win. We all want to win in this space. I think in, in many ways, surgeons are aligned with the hospital administration and with technology. And I think finding a way to do that has been, I think, meaningful and really exciting for us. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your experiences with the group today. And thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you want to continue the conversation. And with that, I hope you all have an excellent rest of your day.